Go ahead, Tricia. All right. Welcome everybody to our monthly meeting, um, Youth and Ed. Um, we are going to start today with Miriam from Deborah Glick's office who popped in to visit just to give us an update from, from her office. Welcome, Miriam. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I'm still here. I'm still doing scheduling and constituent services, um, but we wanted to check in and see what's happening on the local level with schools. Um, I know that you guys have some um, election slash endorsements happening for CEC uh, seats. And I know that you guys are looking at um, high school um, policies, admissions, um, some uh, lottery and testing um, is going around and you guys want to know what's happening with kids because of COVID, because of uh, maybe not having access to um, other teachers and students that they used to have. And so you're catching up to see where the kids are and what you need moving forward. And so the member wanted me to just join in and figure out what's happening on the local level. Um, well, you're in luck in one of those areas today because we um, I have gotten the results from not all of our schools, but- Hi. Bob? Oh, hold on, let me take this off. I'm in a sort of community board meeting now, but what's up? No. Um, so we have uh, results back from um, three of our schools in terms of the high school admissions. And maybe since you're here, I can, I don't have it quite ready. So just bear with me guys. I had a different thing on my screen, but I'm going to pull this up. Uh, we did hear back. Um, from LMC, um, LMC had 66 students out of 117 um, got into a school in their top three choices. That is, you know, slightly above half. We have another 21 students who got a school in their top five for a total of 87 students that got one of their top five choices out of 117. There were 26 students who got below their top five choices and four students who matched to a school that wasn't on their list at all. So, Seth thought that this year was the best of all the years since they started the, uh, the new admissions process with the lottery and taking away the geographic advantages for District 2 at Lab School at Millennium and, and our other schools here. So um, his impression is that uh, he did see um, he did see a lot of uh, choices that he hadn't been seeing two years ago. In other words, families are starting to understand some of the other schools that they have to choose from. There seems to be more of an embracing of that. Um, 289 saw the same thing. Um, I can pull that up now. Um, Seth thought, you know, he, I said, is there anything that, that struck you as being inequitable or something of note? And um, he said that certain schools had a large set aside for um, diversity admissions, which is an imperfect measure. And it seems to um, hurt some students. And so I thought that would be something we can look into more in terms of what that rubric is, because I wasn't aware there was a rubric. Um, it's been incredibly successful, as we know, in some ways. Um, so it would be interesting to do a deeper dive into that to find out um, what might be throwing that off um, this year. But all in all, he said it was the best year they've seen in a few years. So that was good. And then we had at 289, bear with me. Okay. Um, we had uh, School of Dual Language and Beacon are the top two on the her students' lists, which I thought was really interesting. This year, more people put environment, the School of Environmental Studies on their list. And uh, it used to be on the bottom of their list, and it isn't anymore. Um, one student, she said, had that school as a first choice. Other had it as a 12th choice. Um, no one was placed 
there without it being on their list. That was new. She also said that 91% of her students matched to um, a school on their list. Okay. She said that 35% matched to a school in their top five. Okay. She said that 26% matched to a school in their top three. So while we're not seeing increased percentages in top three and top five, we are seeing um, a diversity in schools that we haven't seen previously. Um, the most matched schools for 289 was environmental studies, dual language and Asian studies, and Beacon. The specialized schools, 13% matched for LaGuardia, Brooklyn Tech, Brooklyn Latin, and Bronx Science. They were matched all together out of a class of 80, 80 students. They were matched to 45 different schools. I thought that was remarkable. Four students of the seven who did not match to a school are going to private school. She does not okay. know what the other three are doing. 26% applied to a private school as a backup. And that's where we are. She doesn't know which ones obviously are going to opt to go to private school just yet because that can happen later in the summer. Um, but she said that was a pretty high percentage. And um, let's see. 276. We have 46 students received one of their top five choices. 28 students received choices 6 through 12. Six students received an offer not on their application. Two students received only a specialized offer. So their class did a lot better with the top uh, five choices. So it just seems like, you know, it seems as though my, my, my over, overall impression is, is that families are embracing more schools. We are still not, uh, we have a lot of students still not getting their top five choices more than half of the class in most cases. Um, we had a much better situation with the students getting their top, you know, a, a school on their list, one to 12. Like for instance, we only had um, six out of 82 not get an offer. And we had been at, as you know, we had been at 15, 20% uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. So, it looks like things have improved slightly, even if people are not, you know, um, half of the class is not thrilled, obviously, because they're not getting their top five. Um, Spruce Street, I wrote them three times. I have not heard back from them. Um, so if I do, I'll make sure to report on that next month. But if anybody has any questions on that, um, otherwise, Miriam, you can, you know, give us, if you have any updates from Deborah's office, we'd love to hear them. Oh, no, thank you for that. Um, no updates tonight. You know, she's on the chair of environmental of the environmental committee. Mm -hmm. um, so she's doing some other things. She used to be the chair of higher ed, but I just wanted to listen in um, and uh -huh. see what's happening with the high schools um, and, and the lottery process. Okay, great. Well, that's the news, everyone. Does anyone have any questions on the findings? Actually, I was curious, Trisha, do we have the same for, for middle? Uh, no, we don't. We don't have the same for middle. It's a, it's a little different, but we certainly could run it. Okay. We've had, we've had less, um, response previously when, when doing that data, I think it's harder. It's harder to pin down. Right. So, um, high school, everyone is very interested in, um, talking about it. I think because also the. The change in the admissions process was remarkably different and it involved students leaving the entire district to go to school. And we had some kids, it was a 
you know, assigned to schools in Coney Island. Yeah. So it was, you know, obviously um, there were bigger concerns than getting a different school in D2 for middle schools, but it would be a really interesting thing to do. So I'll, I'll try again for, for next month. So thank you so much, Trisha. This is great. I was just um, a couple things. One, I hope we follow back up with, um, I don't know if they know by the end of the, you know, end of the school year or, the, or, you know, how we can follow up. Like I already know some people that got matched families that I know that are sadly, they're all going to private. They're not going to take the match. Um, so I'm going to be curious as to, you know, and I think some of it is just location to your point. Um, but I'd be curious as to, you know, if that, if, you know, I don't know if it's right before school lets out, if they know if they could go back to the, you know, if the principals could go back to the families to say, did you, re are you really going to wherever you got matched to? And, you know, especially the kids that get specialized. And I'm assuming that's still the case that, that it's possible to get LaGuardia, a specialized high school and a general match. That's, is that still true? That's still true, right? It's supposed to be possible, but interestingly, you know, you saw it in one of the cases here that they got no other match, um, which means that the DOE could be looking at that fact that they got the specialized matched and give that that other seat to someone else. That's new behavior, right? Like, I think we, we need to, to follow up on that. I, yes, exactly. I, I think that's a that's a very big thing because. Um, as we know, that was one of the beauties of when we came through the program, you actually could have up to 3 choices in very different ways. Um, and then the other piece of it is, I don't know if we can collect that and either put it on the community board or ask the schools themselves to post it on their website. Cause I think that this is now a historical document that, you know, when people are thinking about which middle schools they want to go, you know, where do kids end up from there? Or if there's even such thing as a trend, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there is or isn't, or. You know, if they go to 40 different schools, maybe there's no such thing as a trend anymore. But um, I will just say that the families that I know in the in the area, many of them are like, you know, I, I'm not going to get what I want. So maybe I should just put my kid into private school earlier. And I've been saying, don't do it. There's too many good public schools like, you know, just that's not the wise thing to do, especially given the cost of college. But uh, <laughs> but that's a separate story. But anyway, those are just some random thoughts. Yes, I agree. I just think there's so much uncertainty, you know, Sorry. and a lot of these families, you know, 1 of the things that our committee recommended in that resolution was that the DOE do a better job of. You know, familiarizing the parents with these other schools, you know, I know a couple of families that have gone to the school of environmental studies 1 that went to the school that, that an advertising school 1 that went to another 1. I had never heard of to be honest with you. And they're really happy. And I think that a lot of it has to do with the fact that they've never heard of these schools and the DOE just started assigning people to them with no kind of open house, no kind of discussion before they changed the admissions process. And I think it was alarming. And I think we lost a lot of families that year um, that who said, we're out, you know, I don't trust this system anymore. Um, and I think that if they would have taken the time, they would have you know, possibly seen some of the, uh, the things that we're seeing today, which is definitely better. I think they've also done a better job at, at matching, um, you know, to have 20% not get any of their 12, um, and some not match at all. That's what we were faced with 2 years ago. And now we're down to a very small percentage of that of those in our schools, which so it shows that they've done something to improve that matching that matching system. Um, and I think it. Is more than just the parents diversifying the choices with the kids. <laughs> it yeah, seems uh, like. Yeah. And so Trish, Trish, I, uh, you see the note in the chat. There's that's a that's important. Um, hold on one second. Sorry, I've got my uh, emails up to the right, so I didn't have it. Uh, so Trish, this. That yes, I'm true. reading uh, CEC three. I'm reading a chat from someone in D3 that's with us tonight. I mean, in CEC3 who's with us tonight, who said they had um, 
similar results. Almost all kids who got specialized offer did not get offers from gen ed schools. This is counter to what they have publicly been saying. There is a it says there is a Chinese wall. A Chinese wall is a Wall Street term where you're not supposed to cross from one side to the other if there's insider information in terms of the idea that they sh they're not colluding with each other. Which ah, clearly they are. Here, and Wendy, I moved, yeah. the per I moved the person over. So if you would like yeah. to speak, let so, know. Sure, I'd love to hear so, from it. Who is who is our guest from CEC three? Hi, hi. My name is Ursula, and I live downtown. Um, but one of my sons is in school on the Upper West Side, so I've been on CEC three for a few years. And um, when the offers came out, we started hearing from parents um, who had expected to go one way, who had expected to have multiple offers um, or offers different to what they did have. Um, and we conducted a few informal surveys that we sent out. We have um, over 100 parents who responded. And mm -hmm. it was not true across the board, but largely 90% or so of the families that we surveyed had got only one or the other offer, even though we were told very clearly by the DOE in the lead up before that getting an offer to one would not affect an offer to another. Um, clearly, this is not what's actually been going on, but that's what they had said would happen. And I, and I think um, I just want to add one more thing. Sorry about um, you said that the matches have been much better and that's true. Many more people got the uh, got their first three choices, but we should remember that uh, we lost a lot of students. So there's a lot more seats. Yes, that's true. We did. We did, although our, our enrollment here, you know, we went from 89 to 80 at 289, you know, it's not significant. Our, our middle schools here, um, interestingly, uh, held their enrollment better than our elementary schools did. Um, can't quite figure that out, but it, we did. Um, so, Sarah. Yeah. So, this trend has been happening actually for the past three years because I have been following it uh, mm -hmm. regarding uh, when kids get specialized or LaGuardia, they do not get matched in their top 12 and a lot of them don't even get any seats at all. And if you look at the statistics you, you had said earlier on, you said the school, one of the schools that had a lot of specialized kids did mm -hmm. not get as many matched as the school that did not have as many specialized they did they did not get a lot of uh, kids going into specialized they got more matched so they are and this has been frustrating because the DOE says one does not affect the other i think currently now the trend for the past three years it's a blatant lie they, they definitely look they definitely look at that and we'd love to get somebody from the DOE just to explain it uh, because we're seeing it more and more and more with a lot of my friends also uh, if they got specialized, they did not get in their 12 or they didn't even get anything. Do you, uh, is it, where are you, um, are you being specifically talking about a school, Sarah, or? I mean, this is, is from what I've, uh, this is what I'm, I've been, I've been hearing from some of the, the friends I had that have had their kids, not just in, uh, in Spruce and downtown. Even in the even in the upper east and the upper west side, so okay. this is just across across the board, and I'm just I'm just hearing that uh, that if they got a specialized, they did not get a general a general admission. Interesting. Well, you know what we can do. I really had hoped to have Spruce Street's information. Um, I'm going to continue working on that. Uh, I'll, I'll push it. I'll I'll call. Uh, let me call a, a couple of teachers. Because I know they're they're very guarded. I don't know the extent to be most of the time very guarded with their information. Uh -huh. uh, but let let me ask around and let me see if I can get somebody there who's actually in eighth grade now of what's going on. Yeah, we're just trying to help them. And yeah. I do under, I do understand the reluctance of getting specific. Um, but you know, it really is just statistics, not names. And yeah, yeah. we're trying to identify trends. And we're also trying to mitigate 
a situation if there's a problem and there was very much a problem and our resolution along with those resolutions from other community boards i think is what what helped move this to a better place so the more we can get um you know involvement from all of our schools the better the data will become and so if you, uh, we would appreciate any help you have with that okay. and what, what we can do is uh have uh ask kelly mcguire and our our cec representative to attend the june meeting um Lucy and and then I can, you know, work this data uh, into a document and then we can then, you know, put together some questions for them. Uh, that being a big one of them. And okay, that's great. And, and I think because a lot of the parents from Spruce Street that I've been telling them to come to the community board, they really need the help because they have, they're having a lot of issues. Somebody nearly got run over uh, recently. Uh, because of just the way it's just set up on the um, on the Spruce Street side, so I, so I told them just to get organized and try to come if not to the May to the June meeting, and I uh, and I'm they're pushing to see if Nancy can also make it, and then so maybe they'll you know they'll collect. I'll tell them the community board is also looking for some information. Uh, hey, so the PTA, me, uh, yeah. yeah, the PTA person did reach out to me, and we have connected them. And okay. we, are, we are going to be working with the transportation committee, um, okay, the executive committee. We've pulled in the DOT already. Um, Amazing. Everything's rolling with that. Yeah. So okay, thank great. you. Okay. Thank you for referring her because yeah. she, we'll get this going. Um, okay, that, that's been an awful traffic hazard. Um, yes. It's so long and now it's just worse. Yeah. And. Okay, great. So we'll see what we can do because the signage apparently is hidden right now as well with that scaffolding. So no, with that illegal shed from a restaurant, uh, which is even another story. But anyway, okay. So I'll reach out to them and see if I can get you as much information uh, as possible uh, for you. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Sarah. Um, okay. Um, let me see what else we can go to. I haven't heard from Owen yet, so I'm going to pull He's up. He's here. Something. I, 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 I oh, place So should I move him over? Yes, please move him over if you would. Um, and let me know when he's up. I can't see. Once he's a panelist, you'll let me know, Lucy. Owen, you can unmute yourself, please. Uh, hello. Hello, Owen. So everyone, I would like you to meet Owen Thomas. He is a neighbor of ours in CB1. Um, he had come to me uh, a few months ago and has been incredibly patient as we have had a couple meetings cancel and another one postpone um, when we had that busy month. Um, so he has been very patient in coming to us to talk about this wonderful um, soccer club as as those of you who have children who play this wonderful sport you know that almost all of these clubs are paid to play it's very exclusionary very difficult for a lot of our families it can be over five thousand dollars to play year-round soccer owen somehow found this soccer club um, called two bridges and it is it pulls kids from all over the five boroughs and he came to me asking for ideas on how to find um, support funding for them. So I connected him, you know, obviously there, there are ways that we can do work with the city council. Um, there are all kinds of funding streams for, for things like this. So we've connected him with a couple of those people, but I thought it would be great to have him come. Tell us a little bit about this club and what we can do to support them. Um, I think it's also going to be great for people to know about it because I had never heard of it and um, I'm sure there'll be parents really interested in it for their own kids. So without further ado, Owen Thomas. Um, okay. Hello everyone. Um, I'm sorry for being late and thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk about my soccer club. It's called Two Bridges Football Club, TBFC for short. Um, it was founded, let's say, about two years ago, so we're, we're pretty new. Um, it's a 501c3 nonprofit soccer team, um, and we have about 50 players over two teams right now, although we just had about 25 graduate from our 04 team. 
And so um, I think Two Bridges is a very special soccer team in that it breaks the mold of competitive soccer teams. And I see just like uh, Ms. Joyce was explaining, a lot of competitive teams are very, very expensive and 5,000 is the fee just to join. And then there's also, you know, you have to buy balls and jerseys and cleats and everything else and transportation to, and accommodation to tournaments. And Two Bridges is completely free from all of that to uh, simply joining the team. And what this does is we get people from really all over the city from all sorts of background, socioeconomic, um, ethnic, everything else. Um, we have, uh, we're committed to the 70-30 ratio where 70% of families are low income or 70% of our uh, players come from low income families. The other 30 don't have to. Um, yeah. And so th what we do is uh, we're a competitive team and we offer them uh, players pathways to college and to professional play. Uh, of our O4s that kind of graduated from the program last year, uh, five of them went uh, professional, which is pretty amazing. Not necessarily D1, but they all went to play in Germany and other places in Europe. And um, something like that I think is pretty striking about, uh, like a statistic that's pretty striking is we had 175 players try out for our uh, 06 team before it was created last year. And I think that kind of shows there's only about 20 slots, 25 on the team. Um, so that kind of shows the demand for something like two bridges and kind of how unique it is. Um, and so in addition, in addition to being um, a soccer team, we also offer academic help. Uh, we have tutoring, uh, special tutoring, like one-on-one -on -one sessions for people that we think are, or that are in danger of not graduating high school because their grades aren't good enough. And um, we also we also offer like test prep and homework prep and uh, even college like guidance sort of things like that. Um, and then. So a little statistic, 21 students had their GPA go up um, by 10 points uh, since joining TVFC. So that's pretty cool. Um, and we also have like this a, a leadership development program, which is just, you know, it's helping with leadership skills. And is also like a men you're assigned a mentor when you join Two Bridges, which is one of our board members or our coach himself. Um, and also 100% because of this, 100% of our uh, players have graduated high school and have uh, gotten into some college, whether or not they decided to go. So, yeah, um, and then, so because we're completely free, we don't have a super reliable source of funding at all. Um, we have a couple of sponsorships, uh, some were with bigger uh, corporations like City and Nike, but mostly they're with like uh, local businesses, like you're not gonna know the names, but a uh, Cafe Arone and Berber Street Food. Um, and we have a couple of events that raise money. We have a, a gala that we have that happens every year. And um, we do this charity run, which is actually happening again this year. I'm helping set up a GoFundMe and like fundraise for it, where it's like, it's similar to what every, every mother count does, where it's uh, you donate some amount of money for every mile run by the team. Um, it's a half marathon. And then we also have donations and our donations go towards funding the aforementioned programs and also towards helping pay for like winter clothing and even meals after games sometimes and even uh, legal support for to permanent res residency because some of our players don't have uh, green cards. Um, yeah. And then as for future plans for the club, um, we also we want to uh, expand our academic programs and our uh, like college prep programs. Um, we want more age groups, hopefully, instead of just 06 and 05, um, which is what's, what we have right now. Um, and then exp helping expand like our, our pathways to going pro and our opportunities there. Um, and also a bigger uh, scholarship fund to help pay for our athletes to, to go abroad and to, to colleges. And yeah, um, so, so, you know, I think my club's very special in its mission. It's very unique. Um, and I'm really proud to be a part of it and to be helping out with my coach. Um, so I, I guess just anyone, if you know anyone who would like to support, who would like to you know, get the word out there, just I don't know, post on social media or something like, at least what these guys are doing, they're doing a run um, in about a month, things like that. That would be amazing. Um, I, we're always looking for like field space because that can be an issue in the city. And um, uh, we're trying to get more tutors and uh, maybe kind of almost free tutoring, although that's been difficult to find. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Well, Owen, thank you so much for all that information. I actually learned something today and I even met with you to discuss it. So, um, so thank you so much for coming. And I wanna give the committee members a chance to ask you some questions. Wendy. 
Yeah, that was great, Owen. Um, so where do you mainly play and practice? Um, we usually play on Roosevelt Island because one of our um, teammates lives there. So it was relatively easy for us to get the, the field. It's called Jack McManus Field. And so we train there. And then in the winters, we also train sometimes at Pier 40. This is when it, gets, when it gets cold. The other teams don't play outside, so we can play there. And um, also, I, I talked to my school. I kind of like uh, negotiated with them to let us use the gym during the winters. So we trained at, uh, at my school's gym as well on the weekends. Well, we're certainly happy to help you find some space. It's something that we spend a lot of time doing here, um, trying to find uh, our schools and um, sports teams space. It's it really comes at um, quite a premium in this town. So we're happy to consider uh, ideas for that. And, um, you know, maybe what would be helpful. Does anyone else have any questions? I should ask before I go on. No, I just like to. Send me his email account and some contact information in case the public would like it. Thank you. You can yes. place it in the chat, Owen, to me or, or to everyone. Thank you. And Owen, I think what would be great too is um, if you could send a follow up to Lucy and copy me. I think to have a list of specific asks, like you said, like, you know, funding streams, uh, space, tutors. You know, I, I didn't even know about the academic piece, which is wonderful. Um, and if you put together a list of some of the of the needs and the asks, then we can circulate it and see if some people can come up some, with some ideas of different kinds of fundraising we might be able to help you with. Um, but you know, I think a, an obvious one is to work with our city council, and there's discretionary funds that come through the borough president's office and city council office and as the other one that you applied for recently, um, there, are, there are many different kinds of funding streams in addition to these fundraising events. But I think it's a wonderful uh, resource to know about and we're really appreciative that you brought it here and it's great to hear someone's doing something this wonderful and we'll, we'd love to do everything we can to support you. Uh, sorry, one Thank quick you. question. Yeah. Uh, Owen, you're, Owen, you're fantastic. I mean, uh, the way even you you articulated more better than most uh, grown ups I know and I work with. So thank you for that. Uh, are you registered uh, as a five hundred three one C or not yet? Because for fundraising, I'm just thinking, but that would be the first question I get. Yes. Okay. Okay. So send all this if, if uh, in the chat. Uh, if you have that information, that would be great. Thank you. Um, and I had two suggestions as well. Uh, one is reach out to Trinity Church Wall Street because they do have a large interior gym. And I think that they are looking to help nonprofits in the city, um, especially as relates to space. So that might be an option. I'm, I, I'm sure they have huge demand for the space, but it doesn't hurt to reach out to them. Um, so that's number one. Number two is I was recently introduced to um, something called the City Tutors. Org. And I'm not sure what grade levels they service, but it is also a 501c3. Their services are free and it is sort of off like sort of tutoring at your own pace, if that makes sense. I don't know enough about it yet, but um, I would refer you to check that out as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll definitely keep in touch with you, Owen, and um, see what we can do as you know over the next few months. Um, but it would be great to just have that follow up list that we can then forward for you, and um, so that you can develop those relationships directly with with some of these people. So um, so we'll look for that, and you're welcome to come back anytime with updates or you know something else that comes up that you might need our help with. Um, we're just really happy to have your club on our radar and to have had you come today. So thanks for the effort. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right, moving on to is, is Marielle with us yet, Lucy? Yes. Okay, great. Over. Give me a second. Want to introduce uh, Marielle Anz Anzalone. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly from Wild NYC Wildflower Week. Um, she's looking for some school engagement in um, 
a campaign that she's doing. So I'll let her take it from here. Welcome, Marielle. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, there's my video. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Sorry about the technical difficulties earlier. Um, so I'm just going to get right into it. Um, I am a botanist in New York City, which I know is weird, but that's what I do. Um, I used to work for the city parks department and um, I currently have my own small not for profit and we encourage New Yorkers to get to know our local flora. And I've had a couple of um, uh, outward facing projects, uh, community engagement and education projects in the past. So some of you might know the series that was on WNYC last year um, Brian Lair had a series about trees where once a month we talked about trees. That was my program. So some people are familiar with that. Um, so this year I'm doing something new and we're asking New Yorkers to vote for an official wildflower. So New York City has an official flower, which is the daffodil, which is great. Um, but we also feel like there's a richer conversation that we can be having around especially through the um, climate and global warming lens and thinking about resiliency. And so these are all really important discussions that I know um, community boards are, have been having, not you know the youth group obviously, but I think just overall. And so I, I really wanted to talk to you all because I'm really eager to get this into um, the hands of as many teachers as possible. Um, I have a curriculum that I put together for it. It's pretty simple, but it definitely coincides with a number of um, sweet spots for kids in second and fourth grade. The kids learn about all about New York City and then fourth grade, it's about New York State. Um, and then as eighth graders, when they're doing living environment and they talk about ecology and biodiversity. So there's a way to talk about it at a really local scale. So those are just the three that I know of because um, I have kids, but there might be other opportunities to push in also. So um, I'm just going to share my screen really quickly to show you what the website looks like. Let's see. And I can talk a little bit more about the Manhattan candidate. Okay. Sorry, it's asking me. Oh, I might not be able to do this. I've used. Um, okay, let's see. It's asking me to quit and then restart it. I've you, used one might, before and I haven't had this issue. You might be able to email it to Lucy and Lucy could open it. I just told her her prescription is just she should be able to have them. Um, no. Okay, let I me see if I can do that. I'm sorry. Your privileges, that. Take your time. Um, yeah. Let me see what I can do. Um, but at any rate, so, you know, I can talk a little bit more about it as I'm trying to figure this out. Um, so the community partners that we're working with, you know, like I said, I have a really small not for profit, um, but I'm working with some of the city's heavy hitters with regard to plants. Um, Manhattan is represented by the High Line and um, the New York Botanical Garden in the Bronx. And then there's Queens Botanical Garden, the Staten Island Museum and Brooklyn Bridge Park representing Brooklyn. So um, all I'm of these- sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry sure. to interrupt you, but like Trish just said, if you send it to me now, I can probably put it on the screen. Okay, um, so people just email Lucy's it to email. you then instead of trying to do it myself? Okay. You can do both, ma'am, whatever, whatever you feel is going to allow you to present. Okay, yeah, let me see. I, I did um, give you- Because the, the thing about sending it, you know, it's really photo heavy. And so I haven't like compressed the files or anything. So Got it. it's a whole other layer of stuff. Um, okay. And then, um, so. Well, that's okay too. If it's, if it's something that's too cumbersome now, Marielle, I was going to ask you anyway, mm -hmm. if you actually could send um a you know whatever it looks like you know a presentation 
that we can forward to the school so I can make a connection with, you know, put you on the mail and connect you to oh, that would schools. be great. So yeah. More than welcome. If you can get me a, a not too heavy PDF or something yeah. that we can send by email, because my guess is, is they're going to then need to present it to others. And so if there is something that can live on its own that we can send, um, we're happy to make that introduction. Okay. That would be great. Yeah. And so what I'm going to do then is just share the URL. It's not, you know, it's a, it's a really simple website. It's only three pages. There's not a lot of information because we really just want people to um, go there to vote and then, you know, maybe like sign up for the mailing list or something, but otherwise it's not, um, you know, very complicated. Let me just get this in here. Okay, let's see. Okay, um, so I just put that in the chat. So the campaign was launched in March, um, and we're and I'm trying to slowly make the rounds to um, the education committees of different community boards around the city, um, because, like I said, I'm really eager for. Um, you know, local kids to learn more about their local environment. In my experience, you know, I've had kids go through the public school system. And in my experience, when they talk about these kinds of issues, it tends to be a little bit abstract. Um, and it also takes on a global lens. And I think that it's, there's so much that's really compelling about the nature that we have nearby. And it's very um, instructive you know, in terms of thinking about, you know, thinking globally, acting locally, the extinction crisis is definitely um, visited upon New York City. Uh, you know, the flora of the city has been impacted by urbanization and we've lost, lost species in the city that have, haven't yet been lost in surrounding counties like Westchester and New Jersey and Long Island, but, you know, the, the pressures that have, um, the plants have gone through definitely are, um, you know, spreading to those other areas. So there's just a there's just a lot that we could learn from, and also just like you know, who doesn't want to learn more about wildflowers? Maybe there's some people, but that's you know, wildflowers are to me really joyful, and it's just a nice way to be able to talk and connect with people about, um, you know, talk about local ecological issues. Of course, I'm biased. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. Wendy. Thank you. Yeah, this is great. Um, you know, I'm curious because I haven't opened up the UR URL yet. Um, okay. Do you make suggestions for the voting? You know, is it something like there's six flowers and you're, you know, the students are supposed to pick the one of the six or is it yes. great in candidates or, you know, and, and uh, are these, um, you know, can they be found in you know, the Bronx Botanical Gardens, or can they be, uh, you know, are there photos of these that are in New York City, or are they, you know, out in Westchester, or, you know, yes. how, what do you show? I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm assuming yeah. you have a whole lesson plan with them. Right. So, no, I mean, we're not talking about things that are in Westchester, because um, I'm only talking about New York City. Okay. So, um, the partners that I mentioned before were responsible for choosing what plant would represent their borough. And on the website, it includes the plant, the borough, the borough representative, the or in other words, the organization. Um, and so, uh, the and the plant's platform. So, information about the life cycle of the plant, where it grows in the city, um, you know, of course, these organizations all have plants growing on their properties, and so they chose things that also coincided with um, what grew where they're located, but there had to be, um, but they had to be historical to uh, the borough. So, for example, um, as, as I like, want to say the Latin names of these plants. I need to think of the common name. Butterfly weed for Manhattan. It's a kind of a milkweed. Um, it has orange flowers and they were really eager to capture milkweed because they wanted to talk about the relationship with monarchs, which is, you know, so iconic. Um, but they chose a species of milkweed that 
there were no historical records for in Manhattan. So they had to go back and choose something else. So in that way, it's like ground truth a little bit. You know, some of these species are no longer in the city, but you can see them. Yeah, so everyone chose something that you can see, you know, on their at their site. Well, I so, just think of the High Line, for example, like if you visit the High Line, will they have some yes, sort they of have sign? butterfly weed on the High Line. That's yeah, and, and will they say vote for us and they'll have your information so people that visit the High Line can vote for it? Right. So they they're everyone is doing something different. So um they're they have a brochure that they're putting together. They're launching something. They're launching a, a native plant festival at the end of the month. And so they're putting together resources around exactly what you're saying. So, yes, um, they're, it's not out just yet, but it's about to come out. But, yeah, they, they have resources. Um, they will have resources on site. These things, I think, will be live. I forget exactly when, but the end of the month. Um, I don't know if I have an exact date through... I think they said October. Um, so the voting, I should say, runs through November. So um, it's like a regular campaign in that we launched in March and is running through election day, except there's no primary. It's already been primaried and that we have five species. Um, and I left it long purposefully because all of this stuff just takes such a long time. Like I, I really wanted to be able to come and talk to all of you. Um, and, you know, obviously that takes a while, but I really wanted to, you know, find a way to um, to share this with as many people and groups as possible. So it feels long. Um, it's not going to feel long to me because I'm <laughs> I've been really busy. Um, but yeah, it it's just a way to be able to have more conversations. Fantastic. Yeah, that, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, of course. But you're welcome. It's a, it's a great idea. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that so much. I just felt like there was such this beautiful coming together of people of when we had, you know, our last 2021 election. And yeah, and I was like, oh, what if I did this? Yeah, I don't know. So it's just sort of throwing gum against the wall to see what sticks. But <laughs> I got, you know, good organization, like great organizations to partner. So it's like, okay. Here we go. No, I'm really glad you came and you. we are more than happy to circulate this and see see what we can do. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that so much. It's I, really oh, kind. I had some some comments and some questions as oh, well. Oh, sure. Um, so, hi, uh, my name is Rosa and um, I was actually just speaking with the environmental science students or environmental science and studies students at Pace University. And so I will happily share this with them. And we're actually um, working, they're collaborating with um, students at Urban Assembly Maker Academy on a planter project, which um, is going to have uh, local plants and stuff in it. And we're also opening a new park underneath the Brooklyn Bridge on the Manhattan side. So I'd love to coordinate with you on plants and stuff on that. But the last comment I had were, was that, um, I don't know if you know City Council uh, member Shekhar Krishnan, but he had recently sponsored a bill specifically about um uh, uh specifically about these sort of like dead end leftover spaces like around the brooklyn bridge we have lots of them and so the plan is for one of them to at least be a pollinator garden because people can't get there because there's an off-ramp that circles the entire thing so it's isolated and protected from humans but accessible to insects and birds and um I wonder if it makes sense for you to coordinate with his office as they are trying to push that forward um, because that that's leftover space and that's human free and that would right. be a great location for a lot of the work that you are putting here. And I vote for the butterfly weed. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, and I should say, as the campaign manager, I'm not voting. My hands are clean. I don't want to get involved in all of that. So, you know, no one would know because I'm the only one who sees the back end. But yeah, um, yeah, that's great. So that's really interesting. Um, you know, I don't know. Do you happen to know, like, who's coordinating the um, the planting right now outside of just his office? Like, is he working with a specialist or anything because that's not information they would have in house. So, no, like, th this is this was more like a bill in city council that's going towards um, trying to force DOT to um, utilize these spaces and, and plant them for um, 
butterflies and birds and things like that rather oh, than I see. Able to basically beautify leftover sort of garbage dumpy kinds of spaces yeah that are all over the city yeah no that's actually an amazing I mean I think um you know there are lots of studies that talk about um having vegetation you know everything's set up to be simplified and it's all about engineering and so it takes away opportunities to use this kinds of spaces as habitat for plants that are poor competitors, but need, you know, sunlight. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of plants that are state rare. New York City has a lot of state rare plants. We have a lot of wildflowers that grow out in the wild, you know, that most people don't think about. Um, but in the highway, on a couple of different highways in Staten Island, there are, there are city rare, or sorry, state rare plants growing there that get mowed once a year, um, but that helps keep the woody vegetation down. Um, and so there are examples of that, but those they have really good soils there. Um, but there are examples of that, and that also helps to slow traffic in some cases. Um, so I guess it would depend on what they're interested in. DOT honestly does a pretty good job. You know, they did the 9th Street, the 9th, wait, what is it? 9th Avenue. Um, the bike lane that's in Ninth Avenue that maybe doesn't come down as far as where it you all are. It does not. I think it starts at like 14th Street, but it was one of the first like protected bike lanes put in the city. This was under Bloomberg and they and they did, planted it all with native plants. And even the Parks Department doesn't do that, believe it or not. I used to work for parks. Um, so I feel like, you know, DOT in-house has really good like native plant specialists. Um, you know, when I hear things like pollinator gardens, I cringe a little bit because I just, I can just picture all of the hoo-ha they're going to put in there. That's not, yeah. Pollinator gardens end up being things that are like attracting, you know, butterflies, but that's not really what pollinator gardens should be. Pollinator gardens should be things that are attracting caterpillars because butterflies will nectar on anything. It's like, you know, having a generalist versus a specialist feeder, right? And the adults will nectar on anything, but when they're young as babies, they're larvae and the larvae only eat certain plants and they won't eat anything else. Even if it's closely related, they won't eat it. Like milkweed um, and monarchs, yeah. So having that suite of plants that the caterpillars eat is really important. Not putting in things like butterfly, um, butterfly, bush which is not native but everybody plants that we're totally going to be in touch with you <laughs> okay yeah that's great that's great yeah pollinator but that sounds great i mean that's definitely what we should be doing in the city there's so many opportunities to do things like this and we don't i mean honestly i want to uh, you know all right i'm um one thing that i think we should also be doing is planting around street trees that street tree you know trees don't occur alone in the wild trees occur with like a symphony of other plants right there and so we should be thinking about street trees as mini forests and how can we underplant them to help support nature education and weave nature into the places where people are instead of making nature a destination so that's what i really want to do but this is like you know baby steps there's no new york city has no biodiversity policy i could go on about this all night but i'm going to stop talking <laughs> well, but we're really thank you appreciative so much. that you came and told us as much as you did. It was it was really fantastic. Thanks. And thank you. Thank you. So I know much. our schools would be very enthusiastic to know you and know more about your organization. Oh, so thank you. That's I just really kind. answered Lucy. We're totally going to connect you. So um, yeah, I also cool. put my um, I put my email in the chat. I'm happy to talk. I, obviously, I could talk about this for like hours. So if anyone's interested. <laughs> well, I think what it's going to do out. is maybe think about, you know, not only send us, you know, the link I can send and forward mm -hmm. on, but if there's a paragraph that you want us to send with it and in it, think about um, a, it as a pitch to the elementary schools. I think that they especially would love this in terms of enrichment and you know, they way into field trips, way into visits. Um, I know our school was here and I think it, I'd love what you said about, you know, bringing nature to them um, instead of going out and finding it right. because 
the mission that would be for for the kids right. and I think uh, and then we can help with the lobbying piece when need be like Rosa mentioned, you know, in terms of locations and uh, what that process would look like. Um, but definitely put together something for us that we can pass along so we can connect you with the schools. I think that would be fantastic. I will. I definitely will. Oh, thank you so much. This is, you're really kind and appreciative, and I'm really grateful. Believe it or not, I've had some education committees that have been a little heavy. So, well, I, even very nice. Well, you are Gosh. lovely. And just one more point. Oh, thank I, you. I, I think we should um, send the blurb to the community board because at our meeting, we can also share that just with our own members. So okay. vote. Yeah. that's another way because it should be we sh we have committee members that don't necessarily know about, uh, you know, the education piece of it. So uh, yeah. we, we'll we'll share it more broadly. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I'd be happy to um, to do that. That's really kind. Well, thank you all so much. I'm so sorry for my technical difficulties, but I'm so glad that we got to connect. I really appreciate your time and your consideration. Thank you very much. Of course, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Thank you so again. much, Lucy. Bye, everybody. Bye. All right, uh, moving along. We, um, I did hear from Josh Adams at the SCA today. Um, I wish I had more news. We continue to wait for updates from Harbor School. We still do not have this lease. Um, I will say after our last update from them in March that they um, said that we could expect to see plans sometime this summer at the very latest early fall. Um, in the meantime, there was a, a little back and forth between the Harbor School and the DOE talking about um, you know, asks and 1 of the asks had been to decommission this small road. It looks more like a wide path that goes right in between the 2 buildings at the Harbor school. We did hear back on that for who's ever interested. They say that they need it for fire. So. We, uh, well, you can understand that because it, it would provide access for fire. We are still lobbying for that space to be during the day and during times with their, when there's no fire for the students to be able to use that as their own. Um, they can't take out the, the street though and put grass over it, which is unfortunate because it really does draw a line right between the property. But we're really advocating right now to get as much land as we can for the kids. As, you, as those of you who were following this before we got the annex approved, they had the, the lease had the building, but not the front yard. And so you have what uh, you had before you had 600, 700 kids, no yard. So they come out the front door, go on the little path down to the street and to the ferry and home. Um, these are high school kids and they don't have a gym yet. As you know, um, they have no auditorium. They have no indoor gathering space other than their cafeteria, which starts serving lunch at 10 o'clock because they are so overcrowded. One of the other questions we have that I want to go on the public record with is they uh, did the thing that they always do where they um, have to add classroom seats disproportionately to the, in this case, to the uh, new athletic facilities. The, the school was built with the right amount of classrooms for the cafeteria and the common spaces, but then became overcrowded. So the ask for Harbor School was for a full-size gym and full-size pool so that their kids could get certified without having to go all the way back to Brooklyn to swim. Um, but also for, you know, a couple hundred, like 150 extra classroom seats to, to assuage the overcrowding they have. The problem is, is that the SCA, it looks like they are on track to add 400. So this is way more than we asked for, and it creates a logistical issue in terms of these common spaces. With the same thing happened at Millennium with the addition of that top floor. We had asked for open space. They have no gym, you know, at least some dance space, gathering space for the kids. Like there's nothing in that school if you've been there. So the, the top floor, we got the top floor approved, we get there and they've got all these classrooms going in. Um, and now you have an overcrowding of the common spaces. So this is now becoming a thing 
we're trying to get ahead of it with the Harbor School and either an annex cafeteria, lower enrollment. They did say one piece of news I have on the enrollment piece is that they're looking to phase in very slowly. So they will not be adding through an admissions process those 300, 400 kids in one year. It looks like they're going to be bringing in maybe 50, 75 per year and growing it out, which is a release, a relief. Um, so anyway, but we do have a couple of things that we are working with them in these periodic meetings that we have and email strings. And that was the latest. <laughs> this is kind of silly, but I also want to mention we weighed in on these bathrooms that they had designed and the boys bathroom was larger than the girls. So we suggested that maybe they flip that around. And they said, because of the um, way the rooms were laid out, they didn't think they could. So I want to go on the record for saying that we gave them that feedback. I'm really hoping the school doesn't open with a small women's room and a large men's room. And we're hoping for the best there. Um, but it's a good sign that we're talking about restrooms. Um, we are getting the building. It is happening, but the lease is not signed. And I think it could have to do with this land allocation. I want to be clear since a public meeting, this is just an assumption on my part. It is not fact at all, but we are anxious that it was supposed to come last fall and we still don't have it. So, uh, the PTA from Harbor school, as well as myself are following up weekly with the governor's Island trust and the SCA to see when this is going to happen. I hope to be able to tell you next month. Um, I will keep putting it on the agenda until we have the news. So that's all from there. Um, anybody have any questions about Harbor School? No? Okay. Um, and I think actually that might be it. Lucy, I know you need this local list. I do have an updated list now of all the guidance counselors, which I'll send your way. Um, if well, there are parents, it. yeah, if there are parents here, I just want to see if you can send your parent coordinator email addresses to Lucy. Um, it's very hard for me to getting through at the schools and mm -hmm. some of the schools, it's not evident who the point person is for the community board. Like, for instance, when we're connecting people like Marielle, Lucy helps do that. And, um, it's good to have that overall general contact. And if there are different contacts for, you know, very subtly different things, please let us know that as well. But I can't make out from the website who that person is. Um, we noticed that, you know, at Spruce, they have a different structure. It took me a while to find that counselor who um, handles the admissions. So uh, any help any of you can give us that are parents of, you know, those local schools, uh, PS 234, 276, 289, um, 189, um, or I'm sorry, PS 89 and, uh, 150, who we know, uh, just, you know, if you can send it to, to Lucy and copy me, it would be really great to update this list. But you don't want it in the chat. Oh, great. The chat's fine. But I could just put it right now. I have it. Awesome. That'll work. Is that something as... you can talk to Kelly McGuire about? You know, not really. We found that, that, you know, it really is very personal to each school. You know, who handles what? The parent coordinator, I thought, handled all that. And at some schools, they're like, no, this is who you write when you have someone like Marielle to connect us with. Um, some go straight to the principal. So it just is good to just to know the vibe of the school and who you know, who the go-to person is for general inquiries that can then channel people elsewhere so that we're not interrupting someone who it, that isn't their job. And I, I felt that that's what was happening um, at points when I was reaching out. So, um, so we just want to make sure we have that person as best we can. And then if it, they end up saying, no, I'm not it, that's fine too. I just, so I was, I just put uh, PS 150s in the chat. Laura okay. Wonderful, Martin. Thank you. I'm sitting in uh, front of my computer. It's easy to do. Okay, great. And anyone else, you know, if our meeting ends and you can send them to Lucy, that'd be awesome. All right. Um, and that's pretty much it. Anybody have any new business they want to bring? Anything to put on next month's agenda? 
Actually, one thing while we're on the topic of the SCA that would be really helpful for PS 150 is that the sidewalk outside <coughs> on Edgar Street has been closed um, for this entire time that the school has been open. And there's absolutely nothing happening there. So it's public sidewalk space. We could totally u utilize that space as, um, well, first of all, a safe place to walk instead of on the street. Um, secondly, a place for us to convene our students. Um, but lastly, uh, it would be awesome to take the netting down so that we could see through to the entryway, which is currently obscured. <coughs> Apologies. And um, we're having trouble getting through to whoever has control of this to be able to actually clear up that space. You know, I saw that email string, Rosa. It was pretty shocking um, that Kelly had to go and facilitate that communication with the developer. Um, I do not see, I went down and did a site visit myself, and the answer uh, was that they're still working above and that it's not safe to walk through there. I did not see evidence of that myself. Well, even so, if it is, they can cover overhead. That's the whole point of sidewalk sheds, right? Exactly. No, because well, our, the scaffolding, they don't close the street and the sidewalk. They just put something overhead, which is called the sidewalk shed, which we all hate, but prevents things from falling on you from above. And that would be what should be happening here, but it's not. They're just huh. closing the sidewalk. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And they have, I think that they just felt as though it was going to be done. And so they didn't want to invest in that because it would be. You know, obviously super costly and they keep saying any day now we're picking it up, but I do think you're right. That would be a logical um, ask if this, if we can't get a date that this is going to be open um, and see if we can push that. So, um, Fisher, can I say something? Uh, cause, yeah. Uh, um, last time to this morning, I was down there this morning, uh, dropping off my son in the last couple of days. Uh, they were doing something. Uh, they had a blue uh, crane or platform like cherry picker. They're working on the old building. You know, this old, there's the old structure and then there's a new uh, um, apartment condo structure that's very high. Uh, but they mm -hmm. did have some sort of uh, 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 equipment uh, that was overhanging that area. Uh, and, and, uh, they had some men or pe people up there uh, working on it, so I, I'm not sure who was up there, but perhaps they're finishing up and perhaps it should be ready soon. So no one is really telling us exactly what the plan is, what the status is and what the what the progress is, when they'll be done and when it'll be ready. And I know that the, uh, the fourth grade uh, has been trying to organize a, uh, they do a rummage sale every year and they were supposed mm -hmm. to do it in the beginning of May, uh, but they had to postpone it because they don't really have a place to do it. And they were hopeful that they could do it there or maybe in the park uh, across the street, but no one has been able to give us a, a clear answer about when they might, either area would be available or can it be available. So, uh, just well, as you know, the reason we got that Southern Plaza is because they have no other space. Mm -hmm. That is the space. And we fought very hard for that Southern Plaza and the widening of that sidewalk to make that happen. So, unfortunately, what could be happening there, and I can't verify it, but now that I had Josh engaged today, I might actually just write him back tonight and ask him to look into it for me. Cause I know that he, either he or Andrea is in touch with the developer. Um, they, I do know that 1 of the reasons they gave us that wider uh, sidewalk. And the space on that westbound uh, lane of Edgar is that they had to widen the sidewalk anyway, because the building has to put a substantial amount of mechanicals under that sidewalk. So my thought was maybe this delay has to do with that that underground mechanical structure. Uh, but I will, like I said, I'll follow up with Josh today and see if I can get an answer by next meeting. And we'll definitely put that on Rosa. Thanks for mentioning that. Thank you so much, Tricia. Super appreciate it. Could totally do that. All right. Good. Um, Lucy, did you hear that? We're going to yeah. add, we're going to add PS 150 Southern sidewalk Edgar street. To the agenda. 
Um, and then I'll follow up with you as well about these addresses. Thank you. Okay, everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you for your participation and we'll see you all later this month. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.